welcome boys and girls of all ages. Welcome to the parade company. And that's what I would start off with if I was going to uh, give a tour of the parade company and parade studio. Uh, this particular uh, <clears throat> item comes from the uh, old polar bear float, which is no longer in existence. Uh, I started doing, um, um, putting on this when I was teaching my class in uh, conservation at Wayne State University. <laughs> and they would get tours of the parade studio and the archives as part of the class. So when I, when I um, started talking about it, I said, well, let me bring something instead of the photo. So I would normally bring um, uh, Clifford the Big Red Dog, but apparently that one's gonna be used, so all the costume workers have been fitted. So I did ask Arlene King, who was director of costumes, uh, which one is not gonna be used, and she said the polar bear. So that's why I'm wearing this try to keep it as lively as possible. So you can't take me seriously if I have this on. <laughs> um, I have been with the Parade Company for nine years, and uh, it's been a great experience uh, actually archiving all of their uh, photographs, uh, costumes, or clowning wear. Which I do have my jacket here. Uh, this was given to me by the president of Parade Company in uh, 1999. So anything you see with Clowney's face, who is the mascot of the parade, hats, sweaters, everything, it goes to the archives. So I have that too. Uh, before I start with the lecture, I'm going to show a seven minute video. Uh, in uh, 1999, I was hired as the archivist, and it was for a grand project, um, only supposed to be for a year, but they kept me on after that. This is narrated by Moore Crone, and this was shown at the beginning of all of the uh, tours, if you're uh, in a tour uh, uh, at the parade studio. Uh, they have a new one now, but this is the old one, and they use a lot of photographs from the collection. So I'll show this, and it'll give you a brief history of the parade. <clears throat> you're not going to leave that on the whole night? No, that's not. <laughs> Back then, but the reaction of the crowd has always been the same. 
saying, pure joy. Oh, 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 oh. The only Thanksgiving Santa didn't ride down Woodward was during World War II. But it's been an annual tradition ever since. Why, Santa remembers seeing little folks from my sleigh who are now grandparents and great-grandparents introducing a new generation to the magic of the parade. Oh, there's Santa again at the top of the stairs of the old Hudson's building, waving to the crowd. I used to listen to your wish list up on the 12th floor. Oh, maybe some of you older boys and girls can remember that. I'm running out of room in the North Pole to store all the keys. You know, Santa has seen a lot of changes through the years, but the heart of the parade is as timeless as the season. Oh, it's hot chocolate and old noses, fairy tales and dreams, friends and family. Santa's delighted to help with the wonderful history of the parade. And I know the boys and girls have a lot more questions to ask. I'd just like to know, who makes all these clothes? Since 1984, the responsibility of getting the parade ready for Thanksgiving morning has fallen into the caring hands of the parade company. And those hands are busy 365 days a year. In their massive Detroit studio, staff and volunteers are constantly painting, repairing, and updating old floats, as well as creating spectacular new ones. There are always new animated floats each year to astound and amaze parade goers of all ages. If I had an idea, could I make a float? Of course you can. Since 1991, the Skilden Foundation has sponsored a float and balloon design contest for elementary school children. You imagine it, the parade artists create it. Next question. Here's my question. How is Babe the Gulax drive down Woodward without crashing in everything? <coughs> Art director Ralph Skinner can help with that question. Underneath Babe, and other floats like him. And there's a concealed car chassis complete with an engine and steering wheel. The driver has two-way radio communication with spotters outside the float to direct him. In Babe's case, there's also a small opening just below his mouth for the driver to look out. The parade is full of secret compartments and trap doors. It's all part of the magic. How long does it take to blow up one of those big balloons? <laughs> Every year, there are at least 12 giant balloons floating above the streets, varying shapes and sizes. Starting before daylight, it takes a parade crew a full three hours to get Clowny, Elmo, and all the rest of those inflatable stars ready for their annual ride down Woodward. So, what's up with the big heads? The enormous papier-mâché heads have been a part of the fun and tradition of the Thanksgiving parade since the beginning. Originating from a small studio in Viareggio, Italy, hundreds of these handmade heads have marched in the parade to the delight of millions. Now, you might even recognize a few familiar faces. That's Henry Ford, the Brown Bomber, Joe Lewis. Did you recognize this face? It's the mother of the civil rights movement, Rosa Parks. Any more questions left? Can anybody be in the parade? Good question. It was one Don Morris asked himself 16 years ago. I always thought you had to be a local or national celebrity to have anything to do with the parade. And I saw an ad in the paper that the parade company was looking for volunteers and answered it, and the rest is history. Don Morris and his wife Sharon are two of the nearly 2,000 tireless volunteers who donate their time getting the parade ready and making it come alive on Thanksgiving morning. The parade company creates three to 400 new costumes every year. Who do they turn to for help? Volunteers. On parade day, balloon handlers, float drivers, band marshals, and banner carriers are needed. Who makes it happen? Volunteers. It's a simple answer, really. Without volunteers, there would be no America's Thanksgiving Parade. Babe the Blue Ox was the first float I ever worked on, and now it's mine. It's, I feel, a very uh, connected part. And when you see that in the parade, on commercials, on TV, you really get a sense of pride. It's one simple thing, the kids in the street. That's, that's everything. There is a kid in every one of us, regardless of age. Since 1986, David Jones has volunteered his time painting, repairing, and wearing the paper mache heads. I think it's no better reward for any person than to know that I was a part of making a lot of folk and kids happy. Looking for a fun way to put the giving back into Thanksgiving? Become a parade volunteer.
volunteer by calling 313-92-EVENT. A million Detroiters will say thanks. Sam, can I ask you a question? Yeah, for real, what is it? Will there be a parade next year? Sure there will be, and it'll be bigger and better than last year. As long as we continue to get the support from the community, and that means you and you and all of you. <laughs> you know, Thanksgiving is my favorite moment, my second <laughs> favorite day of the year. All right, kids, what do you say we go get some turkey? Excuse me, Sarah, but it's not Thanksgiving. <laughs> you know what? At the parade company, it's Thanksgiving 365 days a year! So, Romy, when people come to the parade company, do they show that film to school groups and so on? Yeah, this one was shown. That's what I thought. This one was shown probably up to last year. I know they have a new one now uh, that they do show, uh, but this one was shown up to last year. So they would they uh, they would come in, sit in the rafters, and they would look at this, and then they would go ahead and start the tour. Uh, feel free to have if you have any questions. Feel free to ask, and I do have uh, photographs from the. Uh, from the archives that will be passed around, so you can actually look at uh, all the photos as well. Uh, the uh, parade started as an idea from Charles uh, F. Window, who was the uh, manager, uh, the window display manager at J.O. Hudson's. He went to uh, Toronto to see uh, Eaton's department store. Uh, parade or what they called it a uh, marketing ploy that has Santa <laughs> coming in on this carriage, this, this tally ho carriage, and then go up to the you know 12th floor whatever at the Eaton Center or the Eaton Department uh, store at that time and he thought it was great so he said why don't we have something like this in Detroit. So it started in 1920. Now I don't know why Macy's also started the same year, but it did. Both of them started right around that, that time. Um, the first floats uh, that were in the parade, uh, Mother Goose has been in the parade every year since 1924 in one form or another. And I do have the actual picture I'm gonna pass around. Uh, this is the Mother Goose float. That's 1924? Uh, that's 1924. So horse drawn back 2025, then. 2025, I would okay. say 25. Uh, this is from the Bird Collection. The Bird Collection actually has the uh, J.O. Hudson's papers. And so uh, with that, they actually have a uh, scrapbook of photos from the original, uh, from the first parade. So um, they didn't have, okay, you're not looking at any cars, you're not looking at any, like, <laughs> uh, you know, with the stripped down car or truck chassis that they start off with, they actually have horses that would actually pull in the floats. And later on in some of the 1930s and 40s, people actually pulled the floats. And then it became motorized probably around the, the uh, no, they actually had uh, small tractors, small Ford tractors that pulled the floats. And then probably in the 70s and 80s, they started with the uh, stripped down car or truck chassis. So that, that's kind of the evolution of the floats. Um, the, the first name of the parade was actually called the Christmas Santa Claus Parade. And it's been called the Hudson's Toyland Parade and Michigan Thanksgiving Parade. Now it is America's, America's Thanksgiving Parade is the, uh, the name of it now. Um, J.O. Hudson's was the lone sponsor of the parade up until the uh, early 80s uh, when they gave up sole sponsorship and then they started to sponsor some of their uh, floats to various companies uh, around the area. Um, Paula Blanchard, uh, former governor, uh, from, uh, Jim Blanchard's uh, wife at the time, uh, Joe Hudson's was not going to do the parade anymore and there was not enough sponsorship. Art Van Elsling, our uh, head of Art Van, stepped in with a quarter of a million dollars to keep the parade going in the uh, early uh, 1980s. And then uh, the Michigan Parade Foundation was set up to actually uh, keep the parade going, and they started the parade company, uh, which actually puts on the event. And they've been doing it ever since the, uh, the late 80s with the parade. Um, 
with with that, all the flow scammer have sponsorships, and some have their products are like tied into it. Um, when I first started working there, the Three Little Pigs float was sponsored by the Honey Baked Ham Company. <laughs> uh, the Good Ship Lollipop was sponsored by Northwest Airlines. And um, one of them was uh, Three Bears on Holiday Morning, I remember this one. It was sponsored by Daimler Chrysler uh, at the time. Um, and uh, Papa Bear, I guess, was holding a uh, Jeep Liberty and the baby bear was holding the Dodge Viper, so they kind of have the products into some of the float. So, um, and like I said, now it is being sponsored um, uh, with a fee to have um, your float in the parade. And yes, uh, the the uh, parade company. What is the structure of the organization? Is it a foundation or a? Uh it's a non-for-profit. Uh, basically, it's the operating arm for the Michigan Parade Foundation. And uh, they actually put on the events. Uh, the parade is their main event. Uh, the night before, they have the Hop Novel Gobble. That's the Black Tire Fair. That'll be, again, at the State Fairgrounds. And they also put on the uh, International Freedom Festival fireworks every year, uh, the rooftop party. Uh, that WDIV broadcast from that's put on by the parade. That's a fundraiser also. If the, I should, well, if the Lions ever win, but if the Pistons and the Red Wings win, they always get involved in their parades too, right? Right. Um, uh, last year, well, I'm sorry, this year when they won, um, I guess they, they informed the parade company probably a week in advance. Uh, I remember when they won, I think it was 2002, prior to that. Uh, floats are painted red and white. They will come in and, you know, they have a big Stanley Cup and they paint floats red and white. The art director, Ralph Skinner, came to me and said, do you have a photo of the way the float, the float looked before since we painted red and white? I forgot what the colors are. Uh, but yeah, they're usually uh, probably a week before. I believe 2002, they didn't have any advance notice. They were there for, I think, uh, right after they, they won and they were there all the weekend. But yeah, they are, I think this one had a little head start on uh, getting contract. And they also will rent out balloons to other parades. Right. Uh, floats and balloons, uh, they do have rentals, so they rent them out to other parades. Um, and they, probably two or three parades for them on Thanksgiving that they do actually uh, rent, rent those out. And they've rent them out as far as Wisconsin to some of, some of their floats. I've also borrowed the, the Henry Ford head and ridden in the back of a Model T and the Memorial Day Parade in Dearborn too. So they'll rent anything, but it's a great organization and uh, uh, it's great to see them be able to get some money that way too. Right. Good, thank you. And they also rent out the studio for events. I think, um, I think somebody actually got married, was married there. Uh, and they were in, um, I guess it was a Detroit Tiger float. And they, they were all dressed in the, the I didn't see it. All I, was, you know, I was like, oh, this is a nice float. No, somebody's actually getting married. <laughs> yeah, I'm wearing any the tiger uniforms or whatever. So yeah, they do rent out the studio for events. Yes. Do you uh, solicit organizations to sponsor a float, or do they come to you? Or I think it's vice versa. Most most of the um, major corporations will probably have the same flow. Our van usually will have a new flow built probably every two to three years. Ford Motor Company has sponsored like. Uh, Santa's, Santa's flow for I guess the past maybe 10 years or so, but General Motors will also sponsor floats. It, it just depends. But most of the same corporate sponsors, uh, major companies will either sponsor floats or balloons. So you have new ones periodically, new sponsors periodically? Right, you do have, yeah, there are new sponsors that, that come on. Um, most of the floats, the, the year, let's just say, the lifespan of a float is probably five or six years before it's reconfigured. And if I have small um, children who are at the uh, tour, I would say we don't destroy our floats, they go to float heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in the old Lynch Road, Plymouth plant, It's in right? the old uh, Lynch Road uh, on Mount Elliott. It used to be the old Plymouth plant. And uh, it's, it's been converted. There are several other businesses in the complex. And we are, uh, I think our square foot is about 60,000 square feet. Uh, I remember 
probably in the early 50s, late 40s, that they, they couldn't use balloons because of the streetcar uh, wires. Right. And well, when did they start using, when they took them out, was it about, about mid 50s? Yeah, it's about mid 50s. And the fun thing about our, uh, about uh, doing the book was actually trying to uh, tell what year the photo was. And sometimes you want to just grab somebody out and say, what year is it? I can't tell. I would use the uh, signs on the marquees, like from the Fox Theater, to see what was playing, mm -hmm. then do a look in IMDb to get, you know, the day, okay, here it is. Or I would try to look at the clothes or the cars. But a lot of the photos were actually had the wrong date on the back. And it was probably done by somebody in jail Hudson's. You have like 1960, whatever. And I still see the streetcar rails that are still there. <laughs> probably the early 60s, they started to cover those up. Uh, I think the helium balloons were probably late 60s. Most of the ones in the 50s, what I call the float balloons. And I have pictures of them. They actually just have a balloon on a float and it's, you know, being pulled. The other problem came in when the people mover went in, because when we were pulling balloons, when you got to Grand Circus Park, you had to pull it down to the street and go under it and pull it and let it back up again. That was... Yeah, I, I have a, in the uh, Up, Up, and Away chapter, I call that the balloon limbo, because that's what you have to do. You have to <laughs> constantly pull it down. Uh, for floats, none of floats can be no higher than 15 feet, 6 inches. Same as the studio to get it out and the people mover. There are some that, that do have hydraulics, um, which I believe um, the Hansel and Gretel float, I think was built in 2002. Uh, the actual gingerbread house would go up and come down, so they would lower it right at the people moving and raise it back up again. How surprised is their father? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, I have to ask you something. I didn't quite hear the last name of the man who went to Toronto. Wendell. Oh, his name was really Window. Window, yeah. Did you say he owned a Window company? <laughs> window is is spelled uh, W E W E N D E L. But window, he was, okay. Yeah, he was window. the uh, actual display window. designer. Window. Yeah, Window. Sorry, he's yeah, actually display. Was a window it was the Window company. Now he's the uh, Window. Sorry, uh, he was actually the head of designer for the, the windows at uh, Channel Hudson's. Oh, for the, for the windows? Yeah, for the windows. So he actually did all the displays, uh, the window displays for J.L. Hudson's. Mm -hmm. So he was more of the marketing person, how to get people into the store. And the first parade lasted about an hour, um, and they did have their uh, mascot, which was the elephant Toto, which actually, uh, I think it was just right around the block, but only lasted about an hour. And the next year they had 300 um, Hudson's employees in the parade, and they were paid to be in the parade. Hmm. Now, there's a lot of things that didn't end up in the book because it wasn't a quote-unquote parade, and they were kind of out. Uh, one of them was that uh, the paid employees of Joe Hudson's um, day of the parade, to stay warm, they would uh, drink a little, <clears throat> drink a lot. They either would not show up for the parade, or if uh, you know, you have to stop the parade for whatever reason. Uh, some of the performance floats or performance specialty units, they would just go right past the person. Hold up, no, they go right past. So, uh, I can tell you that my favorite one that did not make the book was uh, in the Santa sleigh, there was a second Santa in the sleigh who was underneath the sleigh, just in case Something happened to Santa on the sleigh, or whether he fell or whatever. But apparently, a police car hit the float, and the second Santa fell out. <laughs> I hope no children saw that. Um, the second Santa <clears throat> was okay, but because he had been drinking to stay warm, he was, he was intoxicated. But that's the story that didn't make it in the book, which was fun to me, but I do tell them when they give tours. So there is no second Santa now, but they did have a, a backup Santa, just in case. Yes? How are the high school bands selected to perform? All the bands, they will send in, I guess the CD now, but they will send in videotapes at the time where 
uh, CDs of their performance, and then they're selected from that. They used to have a Battle of the Bands, uh, I think in the 80s, uh, at Kobo. Kobo Arena they used to have the Battle of the Bands, so the top, top one would get a prize, but that's how they're selected. And the performance, uh, um, or specialty unit, uh, they will submit um, either a CD of their performance, and that's how they're selected. Mm -hmm. Is there a limitation to how many of these groups that you choose? Uh, I think that's up to uh, uh, the president of the parade company and the chief, uh, uh, one of the vice president handle the operation. They try to um, try to keep it balanced between the floats and the balloons and the specialty units. They probably just have a set number. Usually it's high school bands um, from Detroit and some I've seen like the Jay County high school band from uh, Indiana was in the parade a lot like in the 70s. So they do get them from around uh, the Midwest. But primarily you would see uh, like Troy Athens or any of the uh, other high school band. Now, I graduated from David McKenzie High School in Detroit and the McKenzie uh, Band of Renown was actually, the, there was a photo in the archives and I said, hey, I'm writing the book and I have my high school band in there. So there's a picture of my high school band in the, in the book. So how many uh, photographs did you go through before you selected the uh, well, Thankfully, <laughs> I was, I was had been there at least, I was there at least three years, so I was, I was getting familiar with the, the collection. Uh, when I approached Arcadia, and I, I'll tell the story, um, my, uh, my wife, my fiance at the time, we were in a board bookstore and we saw some of the Arcadia books. And she said, well, why don't you do one on the parade calendar? I mean, on the Thanksgiving Day parade. I'm like, no, no, then. Why don't you just do one on it? So I contacted Arcadia, and they were very interested in doing the book. Um, and they, they said, before the parade company signed off on the book, which they had to do, because it's their photo collection, um, they said, go through the collection and start picking out photos which you think will you know, it would be great to be in the book, and that's what I did. The um, 2002 October was when I approached Arcadia. Um, I think around April or March is when the parade company signed off on it, and the um, uh, Ar Arcadia wanted the book published by November of 2003. The only problem was we had to have it finished in three months, and I've never written a book before, so, uh, and at that time, I was uh, working at Detroit Public Library, the parade company, and I was teaching at Wayne State. And I taught for 13 weeks straight at Wayne State to my course in conservation uh, at the Farmington Hills campus during the winter semester and spring summer at Wayne State. Now, while this is going on, uh, my wife and I are planning our wedding in July 2003. So, uh, we're at our uh, small apartment in Plymouth. Photos are all over the floor. Invitations are on the table. <laughs> she, 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 my, my wife is a school media specialist, and she has a, um, an English degree. She's proofing my work, so, so that was basically how it was, uh, was going on. My last class um, was actually our uh, wedding rehearsal night. And my students knew it, so only thing they had to do was evaluate the class. But the day before is when the final proofs of the book were due. So the parade company signed off on it, and my wife and I did the last one, and, and that was it. So um, three days before we got married, the book was finished. Wow. Nice way to Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, are the pictures set up in some organized fashion that you went through, or is it just boxes and boxes? Like people keep some of their albums or their family photos. Uh, the organization of the archives, I did it uh, chronologically by date, and then it's um, alphabetical by subject. So right now I'm actually uh, reprocessing uh, the photos. It'll start off with um, whatever the year is, and then it'll be floats, and then specialty units, and then, you know, paper mache heads.
you know, just going alphabetical. Santa, of course, he has this major, you know, photo section. And, uh, and that's basically how it came about actually organizing the photos. For the Arcadia books, they give you a standard, I think it's 128 pages, and you can decide how you want the layout for those 128 pages. So I'm looking at the book and, the, you know, um, the information, the kit that they gave me. So I'm doing that and I'm uh, seeing how I want the photos to be, this one large, this one small, and then all the text underneath. And I think the hardest part was coming up with uh, a little byline for each and then with the text, but I was able to do that. I don't think I can do it now, especially not very much, but you know, it was, yeah, it was a lot. I, I believe, uh, uh, if I remember, I actually started the book, and not to be too political, when we started bombing Iraq. It was like that actual week I started, I was like starting the book, so it was, it was a pretty hectic time. Very good. You, what's, uh, your new, what's your new route? You know? Your for the parade? Yeah, you used to start further out of order, didn't you? Right. Uh, the, uh, the original route back in the 20s was 2nd Avenue, um, right around Cass and where um, what, what used to be where uh, Kreschke used to be at. And they used to come around and then go down Woodward. Uh, when they imploded Hudson's and they were building, I think they had just imploded Hudson's right when I, when I came to the parade company. It did used to go all the way down. When they were building CompuWear, they stopped and they moved it back towards um, uh, probably a little, uh, probably near Wayne State area. And that was the staging area was Wayne State. So they would, uh, TV would be right at Wayne State and the DIA. And then they would go all the way down to Grand Circus Park. And then they would, uh, that's where the parade would end at. Since um, CompuWear uh, is finished, now they go from Mac Avenue, um, yeah, Mac all the way down. That's the, the starting point. And TV is now probably where it used to be at, right around where, where Hudson's. Uh, this will be the 82nd parade, and the, for the 80th, they wanted to have it close to the original route. So that's, that's why the movement has changed. So it's away from the uh, cultural center and it's pretty much all the way downtown. They used to have us uh, get our costumes down at Cobo. Right. And then bus you up to the other end at Warren Avenue. And now they're, uh, and then they moved us to the new center. Right. Uh, to new center one, which is that newer building that, that's connected between GM, the old GM building, right. Cadillac Place and the Fisher building. And you walk out, and then they bust you from the end of the parade back up to that point. But um, do you know why that changed, or was it just because of the parade route changing? No, okay. I do know why that happened. Oh, you do? Uh, <laughs> uh, they used to have a hobnob with Gabo in uh, Cobo, okay. and they used to have the staging area in Cobo. Mm -hmm. What happened was, for the International uh, uh, Automobile Show, which, you know, the automobile companies wanted that space earlier for setup. I see. So, parade company, you know, I guess for a fee, or whatever, gave them the space, and that's why it was moving. Cold. I see. Okay. I think the last time uh, could have been, I think, either two thousand one, which is the last time I was in the parade, or I think I know definitely it was two thousand and one. I think it was moved in two thousand two because they had the Hot Nagawa, I believe, was at the Renaissance Center. Now that it's going past Grand Circus Park again, if you're near the end of the parade, what do they do about the Lions fans that are trying to cut across the parade route? Will there be anybody at the Lions game this year? No, just like, kidding. Well, yeah. Yeah. Crossing over. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I, I think, yeah, they, they're, they're set up where they can just, they will cross over the parade. Yeah. So that's, okay. that's not a problem for those who really, really want to see the game. Hopefully it's not blacked out. Thanksgiving. Yeah, no, exactly. That's right. I, I'm not... Has the parade company, I'm involved with, uh, with the light rail situation going down Woodward, and there's two, there's two projects now that are pending. One is one that is going down the sides of Woodward, right. uh, and another one that is by DDOT is going down the center, which brings back the same problem we had 50 years ago, right? right. Uh, have, you, have they been divided? 
negotiating or talking with uh, the prairie company about that one day out of the year that uh, the prairie is going to be going down? The yeah, that I don't know, but I'm sure they're they're talking about that and whether they would have to uh, change the route a little bit or give any. I'm sure they're talking about that. Of course, they can shut it down on Thanksgiving Day. Even if there's rails in the street. Well, they used to have the rails, of course. Exactly. They, they, they would shut it down, but you're talking rail about the problem. Right, you're talking about the, the overhead. Oh, the overhead lines, overhead. of course. I see electric, of course. Of course. Well, it's on the side, it shouldn't be any problem. Right. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, I, I actually, um, <clears throat> uh, even though I have a degree in history when I, uh, at Lancaster University, uh, actually uh, came to the school as an engineer. I was two years in the School of Engineering before I was, they were gonna show me the door and I said, hey, I love history, so. But I actually worked for uh, CIMTA as a transportation careers program back when I was in high school. And I worked on some of the sketches for the light rail transit system. And I and actually, when I wanted to be an architect, uh, I uh, actually did a model of one of the, uh, uh, one of the stations. So I was like, they want to do it again, and I said I worked on that back in 1983. <laughs> uh, you know, of course, uh, the automobiles and, and everything else prevented some of the, like a nice subway system and, you know, mass transit, but I digress, back to the parade. <laughs> yes. In the old days, Santa would descend from his sleigh and he'd go into jail Hudson. Right. Mm -hmm. What happens to Santa at the end of the parade today? Well, what, what they do is they usually have um, a setup, either like Santa's Castle or, you know, and I'll, I'll show you some of the floats. And what they do is they just have the mayor give him the key there and he gets back on, he just gets back, back on the sleigh and then he just continues to the end of the route. That's how they do it now. I know that when you're in the parade, they usually have you get there at five or six in the morning. But one thing, if you haven't seen it, it's fun to get there before the parade starts and just see all the floats sitting there, watch them bowl up the balloons. But Santa gets out of a limo about ten after nine and gets delivered to the float. The rest of us are standing there for three or four hours. But uh, do you have any idea where he's coming from? That I don't know, okay. and I don't know who the, the Santa is okay. either. Okay. That, that, you know, he's coming from the North Pole. That's right. North Pole. Excuse me, of course he is. That's right. Uh, there's, one here, there's one photo in here that uh, shows him coming in the, from a, he has a, it's called a Santa Copter, and he's landing on top of uh, Hudson's. So, you know, I don't know how he gets here, but uh, okay. he, has, he has good transportation anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> does the parade company, what involvement does the parade company have with the TV production? They're heavily involved with that, so they have to um, they have to map out the time sequence because it is syndicated. So with that the commercial, everything is timed, and I, I've seen the schedule. Like this float has to be right. This is when it goes on TV. You know, when they have um, Karen Harlan and, and when you're Devin doing Devin, Devin Skilling, they have the actual book that describes all the floats. So it has to be time. So all that's worked out and coordinated. Now, when they used to go national and local, they went national and local at the same time. They would have to coordinate both when they go national and local. You mentioned that syndicated. The first hour is sold to other stations and is nationwide. And I could tell you that they told us that the Model Ts were going to be in that first hour because Ford Motor Company paid extra uh, to for that where they're getting the money. I don't know, but it was twenty five thousand. <laughs> $25,000 to sponsor 19 Model Ts right. for the Centennial near the front of the braid so it would be in the syndicated section okay. while it's still on national television. Mm -hmm. uh, how, what, how far is it? Uh, in, in how many stations is that first hour played across the country? I don't know. That I don't know. It used to be carried on the right. network. It used to be carried on the network, yeah. and then they would have, like, if it was CBS doing it, then they would have stars from some of the CBS shows would be on there. Like Jamie Farr's, like you know, uh, one of the hosts, and you know whatever. But they—that's how they would used to do it. But it's been locally done uh, for a while. Do you know if the Santa that was in the parade that Hudson sponsored it was also one of the Santas in the store, or did they 
just have all these five or six different centers during the season? They, the yeah, they, um, the Santa that got off the float, and I think when they went up, you know, to the castle that they would have at Jail Hudson's, uh, whatever that window is, it was, they created a door, he would go through that and up and probably out. They probably have whatever the store Santa's would, would eventually would, would, uh, take his place. But yeah, he probably, he probably was not, uh, not the Santa. The same. Probably not the same thing. Probably hired especially then for the parade. Right, hired you know, for the parade. The 12th you know story, uh, the 12th oh, story right. of Hudson's always mm -hmm. had four mazes. Four mazes to get to four Santa's. Right. So, and then, you know. So, so you know, unless he gets extra money, he wanted to stay up there for, you know, anything. But, yeah, they probably have to have uh, well, the store Santa's. The store wasn't open that day anyway. Right. Um, yeah. They, um, they also in the 70s, and this was some of the research, they had um, um, African American Santas as well. Just before Hudson closed, and they still had that last year that they had it, they actually, believe it or not, had segregated Santa. They would go up to the 12th floor, and then they had this whole, it was pretty sad riding the escalator up because most of the floors were partitioned off. They would actually take the children, and if they were white, they went down <laughs> this road to the white Santa. Yeah. It was really awful. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what I was some of the research that yeah. they did have. They did have both. At Hudson's. At Hudson's. Yeah, yeah that was Christmas of 1982 because yeah. they closed so, January 10th right. of '83. You're exactly right. Yeah. From 82. Yeah, I can and remember that. I did get in there when I was. <laughs> yeah, I did that get in there. African American like, right Santa was close. was really sad too. He was really skinny. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, you, so you don't remember Toyland then? You don't remember no, Twelfth Floor? No, I don't remember any of that. That was that was gone. I mean, I just well, remember. I'm getting old. You know, Hudson's at Northland. Young chicken. Yeah, I was. You missed a lot. Yeah. 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 I was I was 15 at the time. Okay. Oh, that's too bad. So I I missed it. The only thing I can see is the the reels when it was in the heyday. Uh, Hudson's for me was like Northland. That's where I would go. That's where you were. Hudson's out there. Mm -hmm. That's why downtown Hudson's doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. What, what do they do? It's, it's always on a cold day. What do they do for that mundane problem on public facilities? Well, they're always having to clean them up. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, they don't have to clean them up. 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 Well, they I was in the I was in the parade for three years, 1999. I was a, a unit marshal. I had on a, a red jumpsuit, and I was with the uh, the Henry Ford uh, specialty unit, which had a lot of their uh, period costume marchers from the uh, the village, and I actually worked there at the time, so that was pretty nice. The next year. I was in a Three Musketeers outfit, and I think it's the one I actually use for, uh, for this, some of the advertising that I did get to Gross Point Historical Society, with a large hat and a feather. And that was really fun. It was, I was with the old King Cole flow. That was fun. I really enjoyed doing that. Uh, 2001, uh, right after 9-11, um, and this one I had Lee Greenwood was starting off the parade. They had the big American flag with the firefighters, fire department. the police fire yep. department, and they were doing that. I was uh, a balloon handler with the Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, which had five balloons, I was with the orange balloon, and I had a clown costume with a fuzzy red wig. <laughs> and I had, you can get the, at the staging area, if you want makeup, you can have the make. they do have makeup artists. And I had an American flag painted on my face. Now, I'm the only person that knows where that photo is at in the archives, the way it's so I keep that secret. Uh, you don't want that to get out? No, I don't want that to get out. You didn't use that in the book, huh? No, I didn't use it. But, but if you do go to the parade company, um, the parade company studio, and you uh, come in right after the, re the re reception area, you go down the hall, you see all these photos from past parades. Now, somebody from the mayor's, I think it was from the mayor's department, uh, mayor's uh, office, took this photo of Grand Circus Park, and they happened to get at least 
four or five of us from the parade company and they had twinkle twinkle little star and they had me out there with the red wig so if you want to I can point it out to you I'm really small but the only problem that I had with balloon handling is that I didn't know how physically challenged that would be I'm thinking you hold a balloon you know at least uh, I think each star is supposed to be five people only three showed up for each star now there's five stars the higher one at the top was the yellow star, and the crowd kept saying, spin it, spin it. So one person would start running, the other person would start running. So we were spinning all five stars. By the time I got to Grand Circus Park, <laughs> you, <were cool. laughs> you want to spin it, here you go. <laughs> the flag was all, you know, it's all over down here. <laughs> I, was still, I, was, I was totally exhausted. Yeah, ha yeah, handing balloons, I don't people realize that people hold signs up that say spin, spin, and they're yelling it at you. And you're yelling and you're, yeah, and and you're just start spinning. It, it could be so. 20 degrees outside and you're dripping wet by the time you get to the end of the parade. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's a, and it's usually amazing. I'm just, <laughs> you know, you have to be at the uh, station area no later than 6 a.m. And that was for the, the three years I was in the parade. And it's fun. You get to see all the floats and everything before. And, but, you know, you're knocked out. I know, uh, I think the first time I was in the parade, I actually, you know, I give you some water at the end. Yep. I was actually at home and the parade was still going on. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. I got home and I was like, I'm tired. So I'm like, <laughs> it's still on, but yeah. It, it's a great experience. Just wave to the crowd. And whether it's cold or not, walking, it, you tend to warm up and get into it. So it's great. The only other thing I had was when you're in one of those big heads, the kids call you over. And you, th you think they want to shake your hand, then they pull out a silly string and s squirt it into the hole in the neck into your face. Mm -hmm. And it's like, God, you little kid, you know, you got to be nice to everybody. You yeah. keep marching down Woodward smiling. Yeah, they do, they do the silly string. And uh, one of my co workers at the parade company, I had not been silly string when I was wearing the old King Cole outfit at all. She came up in the car and just sprayed me. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, there are about um, 3,000 costumes in the parade company's collection, and they make at least two, maybe two, three hundred new ones each year. Uh, and it takes about six months after that to actually clean and repair all of the costumes before they actually put back into the crates. Um, if you are a costume marcher, usually if it's a sponsored float, they actually have employees from that company that actually will be the costume marchers with that float. They'll come in for their fittings, or Arlene King will, and her staff will actually go out to the company's headquarters to do the fittings. And then when you are there at six in the morning, you know, I didn't get any sleep for at least three. Um, you, you, they will take your coat and, um, and put it in the crate with your name. Usually the costumes are large enough, and they tell you to dress in layers. It's usually large enough to put over your your clothes, but I always made sure it was, I was dressed <laughs> very warm. And because it's, um, I think it's about three mile, um, I, drank, I didn't drink anything. There was, <laughs> I had to drink anything. <laughs> no, <laughs> because really once, uh, um, like the briefcase uh, brigade, you know, once they stop and they have, you have to stop the parade and, you know, once you do the performance, so you're, it's stopping and starting and stopping and starting. I said, forget it, I won't drink anything till, the, till it's over. Because mm -hmm. although there are porta potties, you don't step out of the parade and use them, though. Yeah. Yeah. People in the parade have to wait till they get yeah. done. That's right. Yep. Right. Um, there wasn't a parade in 42, 1942, 43, 44, and that was because of the war and uh, they needed the materials. Um, the parade started again in 1945. And Despite being very cold, people, you know, enjoyed that it was back, so. As it uh, moved forward, uh, again, I was going to start to show you some of the 1950s. These are the two of Santa, and this one is actually the cover of, for the book. Uh, came down to two photos that I submitted, and this is the actual photo, and this is how they actually put it on for the book. So, you know, okay. here, and I'm just going to have. 
mess around. Uh, some of the 1960 folds. 1960s folds. Again, this is what I call the float balloon. They just, they didn't have helium until the 60s. We had an incident at Macy's where, where um, was it, uh, Bullwinkle knocked over that light pole and almost killed somebody. We've never had anything like that in Detroit, have we? No, we, no, we haven't. Yeah. And sure. as you notice, no float has ever, you know, drifted off the, off off the float. From the center of the road. Right. <laughs> one, because I've never driven one, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, Chili but, Willie. Yeah, Chili, Chili Willie went to, yeah, that's right, he went to Anchor Bay, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, Chili Willie in 1985. Uh, <laughs> broke off during inflation, and he, I think it was, and I do have it here, uh, they end up finding Chili Willie. Uh, the next day, the Coast Guard found him near uh, Walpole Island, near Lakes, Lake St. Clair. So that's the only one I know that got away. Um, <laughs> He crossed the border into Canada. Right. He said, look, that's it. I'm gone. But that's the only, and that was only uh, during inflation that uh, when they were inflating balloons. Now, the balloons were, um, they were not used, I don't know if it was last year or year before, because the weather was really bad. And the wind had picked up, and they didn't think um, that uh, they were able to hold on to the balloons, and they were not used in the parade. I think that was the only time he would the he would balloons and I use. I know that when I when I handled balloons, and I'm sure when you did, like you said, you get down to the minimum number of people, but they tell you, you know, obviously if everybody else lets go, you let go because you could go up in the air with it. But uh, <laughs> do a Mary Poppins. Yeah, but at the same time, you don't you don't want to get hurt, but don't let go of the balloon either. Right. Everybody else is holding it. Yeah, yeah so so it was fun, and I, yeah. you know, we held on to the star. So, and then that was the last time it was in the parade. You know, Brother, go ahead. you know, the lady who was injured by the lamp pole at Macy's Bray, she was recovering in her apartment, and there was another freak accident. I think it was a plane that went, the sky. I can't remember, somebody took up the plane, and became unconscious or something, and crashed into a building, and it turned out it was hers. Her, her belly club. Yeah, Jeez. while she was recovering. <laughs> From the parade, Jeez. Yeah, from the parade. You remember that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was the person that passed out off the oxygen. And I don't mean the golfer, but okay. somebody else. Um, Here the, the way the book is structured and how I want to do it was actually um, have it as a parade. So I have the uh, Detroit Mounted Police is the first photo. And it actually will go right through with the bands and the floats and the balloons. Um, one of the uh, nice parts about it was actually the, the photo selection. Um, but it's seeing the faces, especially when I got to the crowds right before the last chapter with Santa, is that the faces never change. Yeah. Smiling faces, kids, parents holding their kids, looking at those pictures didn't change. Um, covering almost 80 years just did not change and that that was just fascinating to see uh, the floats they will start off as uh, drawings conceptual drawings from the art department and it's a year-round thing I mean most people think they just they show up probably you know September and whatever and start cleaning the floats now they, they plan year-round and they do um, come from children's children's stories and nursery rhymes where most of the floats actually the, the concepts come from. One of, one of the famous Grand Marshals in 1964 was Lassie. 
Now, Lassie's uh, trainer had problems uh, with getting Lassie to bark on cue. And so when they were, you know, at the end of the parade and on TV, and Lassie wouldn't bark. <laughs> So I think that, you know, they finally got last of bark, but that was one of the things that was happening again that was in the research, so that was fun. Uh, the paper mache heads, most of the paper mache heads um, can weigh anywhere from 5 to 50 pounds. So as you saw in the video, some of the earlier heads, they, they were huge. And sometimes you may have some people walking with that person. If you are a paper mache um, head marcher, uh, the parade company, you know, they would like you to be there, um, you know, before, of course, before the parade, but to actually put on the head and see if you feel comfortable with wearing it. Because, you you know, you probably have problems with, you know, you need to and whatever. But um, uh, most of the heads were actually made in Viragio, Italy, and they were actually uh, bought by J.L. Hudson's, most of them probably in the 40s and 50s. And um, uh, the Italians uh, have, uh, they're very uh, superstitious about their parades. They actually destroy their heads. After each parade, of course, we do not destroy ours. We have one of the largest collections of paper mache heads in the world. It's well over 300. All the Nella hats you actually <laughs> catalog each and every one of them picture and there's a catalog number on the ones. If you see the catalog numbers on the ones uh, at the parade studio, I was the one who put those numbers on. Because those are really now museum items. Have you digitally scanned all the photographs? Or have they? No. Uh, uh, none of, most, some of the photos have been scanned, but most of them have not. We do not get any more prints uh, to the archives because all the ph photographers that do the parade, we just get, uh, we, they're all put on the CD now. So I don't even get prints anymore. Uh, some of the costume marchers, we do have uh, the Distinguished Clown Corps. And this is a group of corporate and civic leaders that give a generous donation to the parade each year to be uh, a clown. And if you are in the parade as a distinguished clown for five years, uh, each one has their own specific fabric pattern that Arlene uh, picks out with that uh, person. If you're in for five years, it's um, half your fabric, half your other clown costume is silver. Ten years, your fabric, the other half is gold. I believe 15 years, you get a red and gold velvet cape. Uh, there's also the Skillman Foundation that uh, sponsors um, uh, children from across the state to submit a design for either a float or a balloon. And um, that's been going on at least 10 years, I believe. So they submit all of the uh, floats and balloon designs and then the parade company uh, decides which one. I think it's a committee that decides. And then that child uh, will come to the parade uh, studio and they will see their float and their, and their balloon uh, actually come to life. I think when I was first there, uh, a lot of the floats were uh, Captain Underpants. I'm like, it's Captain Underpants. And most of them were like Captain Underpants and there was a float of Captain Underpants. But, uh, the little teapots or uh, the one they just did uh, this year, I think it was um, I, d I did see the float. I think they just presented it a couple of days ago. So it's usually when they're making the Skillman Foundation float, nobody's, nobody's supposed to know what the float is. So they kind of have it over in the corner um, uh, during the construction so nobody, you know, nobody can know until that child comes out. Uh, most of the floats will start off with a donated car or truck, truck chassis. And then they will start with all of the uh, metal working, so all the animation, that's all that's done first and tested. And then they will start to frame it with chicken wire, um, then they'll put on the wood, and then you have the styrofoam, so it's, it's a long detailed process. And then the painting is last. So they, like I said, it takes about uh, four to six months 
to do it, to actually construct the flow, and they're doing them simultaneously. So. And they've got what about a half a dozen paid staff, and then in, in September, October, November, it's just right. a, it's, it, yeah, a lot it's of volunteers. About, it's a lot of volunteers. Uh, it takes about two, three thousand volunteers to pull this off every year. You know, with the financial crisis, uh, a lot of the foundations, their value of their investments are down 40, 50 percent. Right. You have an, well, you, you might have enough to keep going this year, but don't you anticipate a huge deficit for next year? That, I, that I don't know. But I mean, uh, yeah, okay, it, could, it, it could be. It could be a problem with getting sponsorships, but mm -hmm. they've They've been able to do it. I mean, you you operate mostly just on an annual mm -hmm. budget. You don't have a, a big. Uh, they have pool the. Of investments. They have uh, the sponsors of the floats, and they have the two uh, fundraisers, which is the fireworks rooftop okay. party and the hot gobble. So well, those are fundraisers. Like mostly in cash. You don't have much left like over to invest. Yeah, that that that, uh, that, uh, that I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, it probably will. You know, it probably get uh, you know a little dicey with the, some of the sponsors. You know, who have sponsor floats. You know. Mm -hmm. How do they feel about having those people that roller skate on those? You know, they a couple times they had the floats where a couple dads on roller skate. Yeah. Uh, those are usually professional skiers. Yeah, they are professionals. Those yeah. are some of the performance floats. Um, yeah, I, I've seen a lot of saw a lot of those in the '60s and the '70s. Uh, some of the photos you'll see the, the roller skating. You'll see some with the trampolines, like the big bed, and they're bouncing. Like but those aren't volunteers. They are hired. No, those are hired. Those are hired professionals yeah. uh, to do that. A lot of the performance. Um, a lot of the performance, the performance, the one who uh, does performance, whether they're with a specialty unit, those are professionals. Uh, most of the volunteers will probably just be general uh, costume marchers, and I believe uh, if you work a certain number of hours, you are, you can, the volunteer can be a costume marcher, but I know most of the costume marchers you see with that sponsored float are employees uh, from that company. And, uh, some of the employees from that company will actually come out and they will um, actually help clean the float and do some repairs. Um, any more questions? I think we kind of went back and forth on the cover. I'm going to pass off a few more photos. <coughs> How many total photographs in the collection? <clears throat> or eight by tens at least, or do you know? Or? Uh, eight by tens, I'm thinking uh, between six and seven hundred. Okay. Total is probably between five thousand to ten thousand images. Wow. Very good. And we also have like the slides, there's just you know tons of slides and uh, have some of the glass slides. So uh, I would I would say total is about ten thousand images. I had a selection, I probably went through probably a thousand, but some just popped out. Santa Castle is actually this uh, like rubber float thing that they have, but this is all like almost like a balloon, or whatever that they had Santa get the key at. In 2001, they played that um, 
Sammy Davis Jr. song, um, um, Hello Detroit. And I love that song at the beginning of the parade, but two hours later, <laughs> three miles from there, hearing that song over and over and over again, walking with the Detroit 300 float, it was like, oh, I've heard well, that enough. I believe in 1999, um, Little Richard was in the parade. Uh -huh. And he had um, was performance float, it was a jukebox float. Now, because it is three miles long, you, you probably know this. Um, little Richard requested that a porter potty be put into his float. <laughs> no, I, I had not heard that one. That's great. So, and this used to be on the tour. They kind of, I don't know if they still, they still probably have the jukebox. If you do go behind the jukebox, there is a porter potty in there. And I don't know if he used it. And I say, I don't know if he used it. But it's, it's in the float. Because he requested it. <laughs> Uh, after I was in the, the parade, uh, I think last time, 2001, my wife and I actually took photos uh, of, the, of the parade for probably the next three years. Because as the archive began to get organized, and then the marketing department wanted more and more photos for, their, for marketing purposes. So what photos were requested by any of the media, um, I would come up, but then it started to get like, well, do you have this photo of Santa looking this way on this float or on this picture? And I'm like, look, I just have what's left. You know, what do you want me to do? Go out there and take the picture myself? <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. And I'll take the picture myself for three years. So, uh, there are, they do have professional photo photographers out there now that, that takes photos uh, from all, from various angles. Don't her out, including those high up, all those high up shots. Which of course I wouldn't attempt to do, but. Alright. Any, any okay. more questions? Any other questions? Well, good. Well, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. I hope right. you can be down there for the parade next week, if not watching it on TV. And, and I want to thank uh, Romy very much.